you got your Bible this morning, I want you to grab it, and I want you to turn with me to the book of Romans. We have been walking through the book of Romans, and man, we have been going through the meat and potatoes of some deep theology, and today what we're going to get to see is really a more practical side of the Apostle Paul. We're going to be able to see a little bit of uh, looking into his life and, and seeing things. So if you got your notes this morning, you'll see that I've entitled our, our, our time together, A Man with a Plan. A Man with a Plan. And I want us to be able to look at the Apostle Paul's life as a man with a plan and that God is looking at you and me both to say, you know what? I want you to have a plan. You've been given one life. One life. Well, you have an extended life, eternal life, but one life in this world. And so for us to be able to say, okay, God, how do you want us to use our life? There was a British sculptor whose name was Sir Jacob who once uh, visited his studio. He had his studio visited by an eminent author and fellow Briton. There you go, Jim. Got a good Briton up there. Yeah, he's up there. He's shaking his hands. He loves that. So fellow Briton, George Bernard Shaw. And so you've got these two uh, men who are both in arts. One is a sculptor. The other is an author. And so they come together one day. And so the author looks over. The visitor noticed a huge block of stone standing in the corner. And he said, hey, what's... What's that piece of stone going to be? What's, what, what are you going to turn that into? And so the sculptor, Sir Jacob, said, I don't know yet. I'm still making plans. He said, you, you plan your work? Why? He said, why, I can change my mind several times a day when I'm writing a book. If I wanted to go this way, I can, I can change my mind. I can do this to do that. And, and so Sir Jacob looks right back at him and he says, that's all well with a four-ounce manuscript. He said, but not with a four-ton block. And it's just a reminder that the heavier something is, you know, the more planning has to go into it. I wish we saw our lives more as a sculpture and less as a manuscript. When there's a sculpture, you, there's so much more planning that goes into that because as you know, there's always more that you can take off, but you can't put it back on once it, once, it, once it is off. And so there has to be a lot of planning that goes along with that. And the Bible gives us, gives us different examples. I, just a couple that I just want to lay before you this morning. A couple of those examples. But before I do that, you've got a little quote right there that I've put in your notes. It says, some of the greatest Bible stories are the results of men and women who made detailed plans to serve the Lord. Our Bible is filled with people who made plans. God had given them a mission with their life and given them, you know, something to, to look forward to. And so let me just give you a couple right off the top of my head. Noah. Noah was a guy who planned his work and worked his plan. I mean, God gave him, okay, I want, the, I want the ark to look like this and gave him all the dimensions and everything like that. But it took him 120 years in order to be able to put that together with him and his family before the rains came. And so there was this element of, of planning that went in. Joseph, Joseph in, interpreted Pharaoh's dream. And after he inter interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, uh, then he was elevated. There was a, a famine that was going to take place. There's seven years of plenty. All the crops were going to grow. All the animals were going to do great. It was going to be a great seven years. And then God gave him a vision. But after those seven years, then it's going to be seven years of famine. And so as God showed him what was going to take place, what would be, then Joseph, God elevated him and, and Joseph had a plan. God gave him the wisdom and they start collecting food from all over the places and he helped not just the nation of Egypt survive, but the surrounding nations survive during that horrible seven-year famine. Even the Apostle Paul, who we'll see today, I don't want to give it away entirely, but the Apostle Paul, who we'll be reading today, was a planner. He was, he was a missionary. And so even in his mission work, he planned it out. Now, it didn't always go according to plan. You know this. God can change our plans, and that's exactly what he did in the life of, uh, of Paul, as we'll see a little bit later. But nevertheless, he said, here's my plan. Here's what I, I'm planning on doing. Even 
God Himself is a planner. Did you know that? I love Jeremiah chapter 1. If you ever, if you ever start feeling down about yourself, you need to go back and read Jeremiah chapter 1. He looks at Jeremiah, and Jeremiah really, he's a little skittish, not real confident in himself. And God looks at him and says, Before you were born, I knew you. Before you were even born, I called you to be my prophet. I had a job for you to do. And this is why even in, in the midst of you know, things that are going on right now, I believe so much in the sanctity of life. Some, people, you, some of y'all have heard me say this before. Some people say that life starts at conception. Folks, life starts at inception. In the mind of God, even before conception takes place, even before you are a sparkle in your parents' eye, God knew your name, who you were going to be, your purpose. He had a plan for your life. God is a God who makes plans. And He has a plan for your life. There are no mistakes. He makes plans. And then God had a, a plan even with the life of Christ and you know, as we see the crucifixion of Christ, I want to. We'll put this one up here on the screen. One of the verses that we'll put on the screen today is First Peter chapter one, verses twenty and twenty-one. And it says, "It says Jesus. Look at this. Was chosen before the creation of the world. God had a plan before the creation of the world, even before Adam and Eve had messed up." God knew that that was going to happen. That didn't call take God by surprise. And He's like, "No, no, 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 no. I've got a plan." In the midst of everything going on, in the midst of, of sin and selfishness and death, I've got a plan. Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times. We didn't know it. God knew it. But it was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. I mean, that's the gospel message. He said, you didn't know about it, but I had a plan. God is a God of planning. And so if our God is a God of planning, and we have people all throughout the Scriptures that are men and women of planning, I think that it's important for us to study and even look at the, the life of the Apostle Paul as he begins to, you know, kind of not step away from theology, but see how theology practically drove his life and be able to see how we can plan some things in our life. And so you see right there, even in your notes, it says some of the greatest stories today not just in Old Testament or New Testament, some of the greatest stories today are being written by the same type of people. Where we get in the will of God, where we don't sit on the couch, where He chooses to use us for His glory. I'm telling you folks, God still speaks. He still speaks and I feel that many of us, sometimes we settle into a rut of going through the motions. It's easy to do. Many times we get busy. But the reality is, you and I have been given one life during this season. And God intends for us to use this life that it's been given to advance his kingdom. But that doesn't happen. Listen to me. That doesn't just happen when you're shooting from the hip. It happens. As we plan and God shines his grace upon us. And so this morning we're going to be in Romans chapter 15. We're going to start right here in verse 14. So join with me if you got a Bible or a device, your phone. And I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It says this, My brothers and sisters, I myself am convinced about you that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Nevertheless, I've written to remind you more boldly on some points because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, serving as a priest, we'll come back to that word, of the gospel of God. My purpose is that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, Verse 17, therefore, I have reason to boast in Christ Jesus regarding what pertains to God. For I would not dare say anything except what Christ has accomplished through me by word and deed for the obedience of the Gentiles. Verse 19, 
by the power of miraculous signs and wonders, and by the power of God's Spirit. That's the Spirit we've been singing about this morning. As a result, well, look at this. I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illicurum. By My aim is to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named. So that I will not be building on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who were not told about him will see. And those who have not heard will understand. Here's what I want us to see. If you got your notes this morning, I want you to write this down. Like the Apostle Paul, our lives are meant to be missional. Our lives are meant to be missional. The Apostle Paul was a missionary planner. If you turn to the back of your Bible, you will, you'll you'll see some maps. In fact, do we have that up here? We can throw that up on the screen. Yeah, you won't be able to read it from here, but you'll be able to see some, some maps in the back of your Bible. In some versions of different Bibles, they say that Paul had three missionary journeys and then, and then he went to Rome. He was taken in chains. And then some Bibles say that he had four missionary journeys. Regardless, he had four journeys that he took. And so I want you to see that the Apostle Paul, he was a planner. He was one that that said, you know what, I want to take the gospel. Many times uh, people might think that the Apostle Paul's home church was in Jerusalem. That actually wasn't the case. His home church was in Antioch. And so he went to Antioch, which was in uh, places around Damascus, you know, north of Galatia. And so he would he he would leave out of his home church and he would take these massive uh, missionary journeys. In fact, we see right here in verse 19, halfway through verse 19, it says, as a result, I fully proclaim the gospel of Christ Jesus from Jerusalem all the way to Illicurum. And so he's got the he's got this. This, uh, this journeys that he has been going on. And you've got that map on the back of your notes where you can actually see his third missionary journey. And you can see how wide spread it was. And so I want us to hear that even as we're reading about Paul's missionary journeys and even as we're seeing the things that he did, I want you to know this isn't just for Paul. This is for you and me too. Let me give you some scriptures that were written for you and me, that we should have a missional life, that we should take the gospel wherever we go. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. So we get into the new year. So we get into January. We're going to be studying the book of Acts. Walking through the book of Acts. And one of the verses right out of the gate in the book of Acts is Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will, listen to this, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's, 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 It's circles that get bigger. Jerusalem, the city. Judea, the region, Samaria, a little bit further, and to the ends of the earth. He's saying that you should take the gospel out. It's supposed to spread through you. And then Romans 10, 13 and 14. We even looked at this a couple weeks back. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a good verse. Every person who calls on Jesus will be saved. But what's God's strategy? What is God's plan for people to call on the name of the Lord and be saved? Grab this. His strategy. Now he could do it, but he wants to use you. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And it's the rhetorical question for us today. It says, you and I are the ones that are called to do that. And so here's what I want us to see as we just look in this passage together. Like the Apostle Paul, our lives must be missional and characterized by a couple of things. Characterized. So I want you to see this. Maybe even think of how you might be able to plan your week around some of these characteristics of being missional. So the first one that I want you to write down of being missional, being characterized, number one, by encouragement. 
by encouragement. Now, one of the things that as we get into this passage, you got to remember, the Apostle Paul had never been to the church at Rome up until this point. Now, he had talked about wanting to go there. He had talked about wanting to, to be there. He's never met those at his church. And, and here's something that I just want you to understand. People are a lot of times, that they're, they're like banks, okay? And, and you can't take out what you haven't already put in, okay? And so what the Apostle Paul understands here is that he understands these guys have never met me. Now, when he opens the book, he says that I'm an apostle, okay? So he's talking about his authority there, but they've never really met him. They don't know much about him. And so one of the things that he's got to do is he just can't go on and just give them a bunch of instructions. He's got to be an encouraging guy. And so I want you to see right here in verse 14, it says, brothers and sisters, I am convinced about you that you are, look at, look at the way that he encourages them, that you're full of goodness. You're full of goodness. He's encouraging them. He's heard about this stuff. Filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. You know, some people are experts. They're excellent at winning an argument. But they really stink at winning the person. I know a lot of people, and some of y'all might even be a little nervous to share your faith around, you know, I, Pastor Dan, I don't know that I'll have all the answers. What if they ask me something that, that I don't know? Then you look at them and you go, I don't know. But I'll get back to you on that. Let me do a little bit of research on that. A lot of times people are great. Sometimes they'll win the argument, but they don't win the person. And to be missional is to be encouraging. We have to be about sharing God's truth in love. And that's what the Apostle Paul does. He, he opens up and he says, look, man, uh, you guys are doing great in goodness and knowledge. Man, you guys are instructing each other. So he's put into the bank and now he's getting ready to take out. Look at verse 15. He says, nevertheless, I have written to remind you more boldly on some points. So there's some things that he needed to talk to him about. He needed to correct a little bit. He needed to, to refine and reshape because of the grace given to me by God. So the second thing that I want you to write down, so it's characterized by encouragement, but also characterized by boldness. That, man, if we're going to be missional lives, then we've got to be bold. The Apostle Paul didn't shrink back. The cause of Christ was more important than his personal feelings. And for some of you guys here this morning, this might actually be a real challenge to you. You know, Pastor Dan, I'm, I'm not real good at, at, at being bold. And, and can I just talk to you? Some of you guys, uh, maybe you're just an overthinker. You're just an overthinker. Well, I got to, you know, do this and do that. And, you know, sometimes you just got to say it. You just got to talk to that person. I was listening to someone this week who was, uh, you know, really encouraged. He's kind of this uh, motivational speaker, entrepreneur type person. And, and, uh, and one of the things that he was saying was, he says, whenever I'm at a place where I'm scared to do something, he said, I've gotten, I've just trained myself to just step out and do it right then. Just step out. And I wonder how many times that we as Christians Commit the sin of hesitation. Can I tell you a story? There's a guy I was listening to this week. He's actually a comedian. And uh, he was talking about just the Holy Spirit working in his life and being able to step out, step out in boldness. He said that he and a friend were at an airport. They travel around a lot. They do a lot of different uh, comedy shows and things like that. And so they're at an airport and there's one of the ladies that, you know, at the gate, you know, they have the, the desk and they have the attendant right there at the desk and whatnot. He said that his friend said, you know, man, I'm just, I'm just feeling the need to give this lady $20. And so one of the, you know, his friend said, you know, I mean, if you want to, I mean, go right ahead. I mean, there's nothing to stop you, but you know, he said, it, it, it's odd, you know, you, you tip, like a waiter or a waitress, you know, you tip people. He's like, typically that's not something that you do, you know, to someone who's an attendant right there, you know, at the front of the airport. And so what happened was, but he said, you know, I'm convicted. And, and, he, and, and he thought he could have, he could have overthought it and say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But he was bold. And instead he stepped out and said, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. 
He handed her $20. She begins to start crying right there on the spot. Because that day she had gotten to work and she had forgotten her purse. And lo and behold, she was just going through a tough time, going through some different things like that. And she had actually run out of gas that morning when she pulled into the parking spot. And she thought to herself, how am I going to get home without a drop of gas and without my purse? And she said, and lo and behold, you come. Imagine if he had said, you know what, Eh, it's weird. Imagine if he had thought that. God uses us when we're bold. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is doing here. He said, listen, I I wrote you. I I needed to be bold on, on some points here. I love you, I care about you, but I need to, you know, reshape, correct, do some of these things. So if we're going to be missional, like Paul was missional, then we have to be an encourager. We have to be bold. Second, the third thing that I want you to write down is we have to be men and women of purpose. I mean, Paul considered himself a, a man of purpose. Look at verses 16 and 17 right here. To be a minister of Christ Jesus, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles serving as a priest of the gospel of God. Now, let me ask you this real quick before we go any further. What's a priest? Is it just a person who wears like that special collar and, you know, ministers within a, a particular denomination of church? You know, is that, is, that, is that what a priest is? No. A priest literally is a go-between. It is a go-between. It is a person that, that is between something. And so the Apostle Paul says, listen, I am a priest between the Gentiles. I am a go-between between the Gentiles and the gospel of God. That's why that there's other passages throughout the New Testament that talk about if you're a Christian here today, then you are a priest. And you may not have thought of yourself like that, but he says that the church of Jesus Christ is a kingdom of priests because you are the go-between between the world and God. You are that person. So that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. A, a priest of the gospel of God. My purpose is that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering sanctified through the Holy Spirit. Now, he, Paul declared himself in this spot as a minister to the Gentiles. Now, um, G- Gentiles were anybody that just wasn't Jewish. Now, let's talk real quick. Paul was as Jewish as Jewish could be. And whenever, if you go back, as we start going through the book of Acts, whenever he goes into a different city, the first place that he goes is he tries to go to his own people. He tries to go to the Jews. He tries to go into the synagogue. He tries to get them to to listen. And typically what they do is they throw him out. They don't want to listen to him. And so he says, okay, that's fine. I'll go to the Gentiles. People that weren't Jewish, people that weren't religious. And so that, and so he becomes this, uh, what he calls himself, a minister to the Gentiles. And, and this is important because God gave him that, that purpose of reaching out to the Gentiles. This is so important because who has God cha- put in your life? Who's God put in your workplace? Who's got teenagers in here today? Who has God put at your school? What would it take for a teenager that would be sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ and not give in to the things of the world? What would that look like where God has given you purpose? Man, so you have this purpose. Who has God put in the workplace? Who has God put in your school? If you're retired here this morning, who has God put in the midst of your retirement? We are so often waiting for the opportunity when God is looking at you and saying, make the opportunity. Can I tell you, if I waited for the opportunity, there would be a lot less people saved here at Memorial Baptist. But you know what I do sometimes? I call them up. I say, let's get together. Let's have coffee. Let's go do something. Make the opportunity. Don't just wait for it. So God gives us purpose. It's also characterized by humility. The Apostle Paul would have had, he could have had Christian celebrity status of the day. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Look with me in in, uh, in verses 18. He says, for I dare not say anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. By word and deed for the obedience of the Gentiles. Do you see see his humility? It's not about what I've been doing. 
It's about what God is doing through me. This is a characteristic of, of every great man and woman of God all throughout the scriptures. It's not me. I'm not all that in a bag of chips. It is what God is doing through me and in me. Let me tell you something. If the Apostle Paul wanted to, he could have had speaking engagements. He could have had book deals. I was thinking about this this morning. If the Apostle Paul only knew the royalties that he could have received with all the Bibles that have been sold with his letters, you know? So I think about that. If he knew, if he knew, and yet he said, it's not me. Can I tell you something that will free you up to live a missional life? To talk about things with your friends, to talk about things with your neighbors, maybe even your family members. If God works in somebody else's life, it's not you. That's so freeing. It's God through you. And so if they listen or fail to listen, it doesn't matter. It's all about God's power coming through you. And some people are just going to be obstinate. Even Jesus had Judas. And so for us, that sometimes people are going to listen. Sometimes they're not. Regardless, it's God working in us and through us the same way it was with the Apostle Paul. And then the next thing that has characterized him as being missional was his passion. His passion. His passion. Purpose, humility, and his passion. If you look at verse 20, look at verse 20. It says, my aim is to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named so that I will not build on someone else's foundation. And then he had a life verse. Look, look at this. But as it is written, and this is Isaiah 52, verse 15. Look at this. Those who were not told about him, who's him, Jesus, okay, will see, and those who have not heard will understand. The Apostle Paul kind of took this verse and he made it his own. He made it uh, something that, that, that it was in his heart. He made it his personal mission, the same way that this talks about, to tell those who had not been told. He made it his personal mission to help those who hadn't seen or heard about Christ. And so this just kind of brings it up to me, you know. Do you yourself, do you have a life verse? Maybe that this week in your quiet time that you go on a search. If you don't have one, you say, God, what's my life verse? Is there a passage of Scripture that you can give me that just drives my passion towards you? Can I tell you what mine is? Some of y'all already know. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Jeremiah 20, verse 9 says, But if I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Let me tell you, there are days, even as a pastor, I'm like, God, do I really have to preach again? Do I really have to share again? I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I got family. I got things that are going on. And, and you know, maybe that there's some discouragement that takes place. Maybe there's some argument that takes place. And yet, God says, but I go back to that Jeremiah verse, it drives my passion. But if I say I will not speak of him, his word is in my heart like a fire. Shut up in my bones and it hurts me to hold it in. Don't you want that from your pastor on Sunday morning that it hurts me to hold it in? That's what I want for you. So what is yours? I really encourage you. It might take you a little time. But that was his passion. He says that I just want to, you know, that those who were not told about him would see, hear, and understand. That was his life verse. What's yours? That drove his passion. In order to be missional, man, got to be passionate. It's not just enough just to have a, a missional outlook on life. In order to be missional, you also have to be intentional. So I want you to write that down. Like the Apostle Paul, our lives must be intentional. Our lives must be intentional. Man, i got to move fast. Okay. So let me, go, let me go quick. All right. So number one, it's going to be characterized by vision. It's going to be characterized by vision. If I, if I spend any time here, I'm going to spend it right here, okay? Look at verse 22 uh, through 24. That is why I have been prevented many times from coming to you, but now I no longer have any work to do in these regions, and I have strongly desired for many years to come to you whenever... Now look at this. Whenever I travel to Spain... For I hope to see you whenever I pass through and to be assisted by you for my journey there once I have first enjoyed your company for a little while. So here's what I want you to see. Paul was a man with a plan. And the Apostle Paul's desire 
was after he stopped off in Jerusalem, he was going to give a little gift. We'll talk about that in just a second. After he dropped off in Jerusalem, his goal was to head towards Rome on his way to Spain. So the man had a vision. I mean, so practical. He said, so my goal is to stop off and hang out with you guys as I'm on my way to Spain. Now, here's what was what's fascinating is we don't know if he ever made it to Spain or not. The book of Acts, which we get a lot of our stories, kind of runs out before he gets to that. In fact, many scholars believe that he never made it to Spain, that he was beheaded after years being in, on house arrest in Rome. But he might have. We don't know. But the goal is, the, 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 the thing is that we see here is that he had a vision. In fact, what we saw in the very first chapter, Romans chapter 1, this is what he said. He said, I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is that I may be mutually, that we might be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, listen to this, that I planned many times to come to you. But I've been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you just as I've had from the other Gentiles. And let me tell you something. When you have a vision for what God has given you, that doesn't mean that that vision is going to work out exactly like you thought it was. Don't be discouraged when, when you feel like you've got this vision and it doesn't work out the way that you planned. I mean, if we were, if we were completely open, I mean, what happens is if historically... We know that happened after the Apostle Paul wrote this letter. He's going to take an offering that he has been collecting, and he's going to take that offering down into Jerusalem in order to help people who are poor. And so his idea was, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to, I'm going to give that offering to the people who are poor, and then I'm going to head back up to Rome. You know what happens when he, when he gets to Jerusalem? His plans get totally messed up. He gets arrested. Thank God he got arrested because the Jews would have killed him if he hadn't gotten arrested. He gets arrested, then he spends years in jail. Spends times witnessing to leaders, Felix, Festus, and then they take him on a ship. He's bound by chains, and they begin to go towards Rome. And then, lo and behold, maybe he's thinking, okay, I'm on my way to Rome. Man, this is great. I'm going to be able to fulfill it. Granted, I'm in chains. And what happens then? Some of you all know the story. He gets shipwrecked. He gets shipwrecked. Spends time on an island and man, has to, man. But he had a vision. And ultimately, he did make it to Rome. And so that's what I think is so important. You know, this past year, we had a vision to go to New York City. We were planning on making trips to New York City to do evangelism in order to, to man, to, to help a, a particular group that was up there. We had plans, and you know what? We had everything. Our tickets were bought. We were ready to go in March. And it all fell through. Had plans helping the Bible runners. Man, we were considering taking trips to Africa. And just, you know, being able to pass out Bibles. You guys were giving, I got all these Bibles up in my office right now. We still got to, man, y'all keep bringing them. It's great. But all that kind of felt, we're supposed to do that in whether August or September. Here we are now in October, you know. Sometimes God has a different plan, but we have the vision. Proverbs 29, verse 18, the King James Version says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Our gym out in the back, man, let me tell you, we were going to reach more people with the gym that was out in the back. It's supposed to be done on June the 1st. We got pylons. It's coming. It's coming. We still have that vision. One of my mentors used to say, if you don't see it before you see it, you'll never see it. You still got to see it regardless of the things that happen. Paul had a vision. He was a man with a plan. And this is something that we've really got to take to heart. Let me tell you, we have been in meetings all week long. As we plan for the future, as we plan for next year, some of y'all have been with me in those meetings. We've had them here next door. We've had them on my back porch because the weather has just been so beautiful. And, and let me just tell you, we, I shouldn't tell you this, but you know what? If it gets messed up, it gets messed up. Here, we've got some exciting news that I can neither confirm nor deny. If, if we're trying to have a back to school Sunday on October 25th, not here, but we're going to try to go to the Copeland's, you know, the Copeland stage at Lafreniere Park. 
I'm hoping that we can do that. I'm hoping that we're able to do that. We have to give the council, you know, they got to sign off on everything. But that's our vision. Can get messed up this week, but I'm telling you, that's our vision. It's what we want to do. We want to see people brought. We want to give ourselves, you know, we want to allow people to see us who might just be out there walking and working out. As we plan for Wednesday nights, I mean, this past Wednesday, do you realize this? This past Wednesday, we broke the 100 barrier. You do know this, right? We have 100 people here on Wednesday. 62 of them were kids. They're wearing masks and we're, you know, we're social distancing and they're in different buildings all over the place, you know, so we've got them all spread out. But I thought, you know, some people are like, you know, oh, we're having Wednesday night church. No, we're having like vacation Bible school every Wednesday night, okay? And so I want you to hear, we are one Facebook ad away from having 75 to 100 kids on a Wednesday night. Not to mention our Wednesday night adult service is growing every single week. And there's not one week that we haven't gained more families. And my, my team looked at me and they said, Pastor Dan, when are you going to be satisfied? Like, what's your vision? What's your vision? When are you going to be satisfied? I said, I told them, I said, when kids are begging their parents to take them to church on Wednesday night rather than soccer, football, and gymnastics. That's what Tuesday and Thursday is for. But Wednesday night, I said, if they're begging their kids to bring them here, I said, that's my vision. That's my vision. Apostle Paul had a vision. Two more things, three more things real quickly. All right, let's move fast. Next thing is cooperation, cooperation. Cooperation. As you look in to verse 24, it talks about him going on to Spain. Look with me in verse 25. It says, right now I'm traveling to Jerusalem to serve the saints. We just talked about that. Because Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased and indeed are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles had shared in their spiritual benefits, then they are obligated to minister to them with material needs. And so he's talking about how these churches all throughout the regions of Macedonia and Achaia were giving to support you know, the ministry of what was taking place in Jerusalem. And then I love it how he says this. So he's talking about them. And then he goes right back into it, into, into verse 28. In verse 28, he says, So when I have finished this and safely de- delivered the funds to them, I will visit you on the way to Spain. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness and the blessing of, of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. As he talks about this, he's priming the, I mean, the Apostle Paul was the master negotiator. Hey, man, all these churches, man, they've been giving to, you know, ministries in Rome. And then, you know what, I'm going to head your way. And you know what, as they've helped, you know what, you can help me too. How about that? You can help churches start in Spain. The point that I want you to see from this is it takes cooperation. It takes for people to come together. Ministry doesn't just happen because the Apostle Paul was a, an apostle. You know, it happens because people were there. They, they came together. Let me tell you, I had someone come, come across me this week and they said, Pastor Dan, the volunteers this past one Wednesday were just incredible. And I just want you to know that, that if you are a volunteer, if you helped us this past Wednesday, you help us with anything. We have volunteers that help us on Sunday morning. I want you to know we absolutely couldn't do this without you. The, the New Testament is filled with examples of people who cooperated for the gospel and it spread and the, and the kingdom was advanced. And I just want you to hear from uh, the bottom of my heart, you are so valuable to the kingdom advancing. We need you. We need you. Next thing is intercession. See that in verse 30 and 31. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in fervent prayers to God on my behalf. And then he gives them what they should pray for. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. And so here's what, here's what we see is that he's saying, guys, I need you to pray for me. And I I believe that they prayed for him because his life was rescued. His life was rescued by those unbelievers, the religious people. They were religious unbelievers, but they were ready to kill him. In fact, the Apostle Paul actually finds out about an ambush that is going to take place. Some soldiers are going to take him from one city to the next. They're going to move him up north. And so they've got this small little set of soldiers that are going to take him up there. Well, they find out 
that he's going to be ambushed and they don't turn it into this small little thing of soldiers. They turn it into this big thing of soldiers. Men and women who said, we're not going to eat until the Apostle Paul is dead. I believe that their prayers were answered. Intercession was answered. And you and I have to be on our knees as well. The devil is coming after us. I want you to know, if you're a part of advancing the kingdom of God, you've got a target on your back. You do. Some of y'all know what that feels like. And so God is saying, look, we got to come together. That's why we have times of prayer in the morning during our time of worship. And then finally, the thing that I want you to look at, we've got to be intentional. Vision, cooperation, intercession. Oh man, this is so good. Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Look with me in the very last verse here, verse 32 and 33. And that, by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed together with you. As I read that this week, I say, you know what, that's what I want for our church. I want us to come together and be satisfied, be refreshed by whenever we come together. I'm telling you guys, when it comes down to us advancing the kingdom for, the, for His glory, we've got to be satisfied. You know, the Apostle Paul could have, he could have settled down with his life. He could have, he could have started the Apostle Paul tent making company. But instead, he was looking to meet with believers whom he had never met before. His satisfaction was being with fellow believers and brothers and sisters in Christ and expanding the gospel. And here's what I want to say as we kind of wrap this up. If you want to have a good life, you can have it comfortable. You can. But if you want to have a great life of advancing the kingdom of God, it is going to have to be uncomfortable. Sorry, it's the truth. It's going to be uncomfortable. But let me tell you, it will be satisfying and it will be fulfilling. And walking along with the people of God is a part of that.